greetings. Okay, jumping right into this one. Once again, <clears throat> we're going to look at a special article by Corey Zorowski. This is back in 2016. And um, yeah, I'll just say that. Let's go. Let's jump right into it. So obviously to get to the website, you just type in thegreatstage.com. Guess what? That will take you right to the website. All you have to do is scroll down and you will see everything you need to see. New stuff will be added here soon, but for right now, this should be good that you can see everything. All you have to there do it is. is. I'm just checking. I'm doing a little audio check there. Okay, so let's go right to where this article is. This article is going to be on the website at the very, very bottom under other documents. So I got it right there. I'm going to go ahead and open this up. So what? I, since I already have it open, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing that one. And then I'm going to hit share again. And we will share the article that I have, which uh, thanks to one of our group members, person was able to find it and get a nice copy. Look at that. Look at how nice that looks there. Boom. Maybe a little too big. Okay, we'll keep it right there. That should be good. And guess what's right on the cover? So this is March 23rd through 29th. This is a free, or was a free, uh, local Minnesota newspaper, citypages.com. They are no longer in business. Oh, how sad. And right on the front of it, final cut. You've probably seen this image before. I'm sure you have. Final cut. Oh, doesn't that house look familiar? <laughs> there we go. The strange and tragic demise of a Minnesota filmmaker and his family. That's what we'll be discussing here. And, of course, it is the one of the lead articles. But nice to have the whole magazine. I have the physical copy, but it would be, you know, I wouldn't want to just keep showing you that physical copy. If you want to see what else was going on during this time, it's all right there. There's a uh, the real Minnesota Civic Test. Yeah, there you go. Pretty interesting what was happening in Minnesota in the city pages area. But let's get right to the final cut. This is starting on page nine of that PDF. Hope you can read this. If not, I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. All right. Stop me if you've heard this one here. So let me just pull up a few things before we get started. Down, down. Boom. Right into it. <laughs> I've been wanting to cover this one for a while now. So. This should be interesting. We'll see how far we get here. By Corey Zorowski, and I spelled it wrong. It's C-O-R-Y, Zorowski. It's page nine of the March 23rd through 29th, 2016 episode of City Pages. Okay, this is the digital copy we're looking at. And again, thank you to my friend who was able to find this and make sure that we had a copy of the digital version here. Let's read through this together. The neighbor set out for the rambler next door. He was uneasy. Colin Procknow and his wife Judy first noticed the bundle of Christmas gifts on the Crowley's front stoop in late December. It was now January 17th, and the Procknows hadn't seen activity at the house for weeks. Colin thought he heard the Crowley's dog barking. Julie, Judy, <laughs> Judy dispatched her husband to check on things. When Colin arrived, the presents addressed to David Crowley, his wife, Kamel, and their five-year-old daughter, Rania, were scattered about the Ramsdale Drive doorstep. He ransacked them, he meaning uh, Colin Procknow. He ransacked them and peered through the large front picture window. Three figures, two adult and one child-sized, lay on the floor. Mannequins, Colin thought. David dabbled in the movie props business. Colin headed back across the lawn. 
His description of the figures on the floor spooked Judy. She insisted they call the police. The stench of death slapped Apple Valley officers before they could even open the door. The scene was like something from a horror movie. Rania, Kamel, and David had been shot in the head, Kamel twice, her husband and child once. Later stages of decay suggested they'd been dead for weeks. Above the bodies on the family room wall, the words Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest in Arabic, were finger painted in blood. Skinny and scared, the Crowley's dog Paleo had to be plied with treats and captured with a catch pole before investigators could fan out inside the home. A lot of stuff to cover there, I guess, just in those few sentences, but I want to keep reading on. Um, what do you think? <laughs> One of the officers noticed the rear sliding door was cracked open. Slowly, they made their way to the basement, where they found countless cans of food and of various sizes, boxes of precious metal coins, and guns stashed in plastic cases. Back upstairs, they passed Rania's bedroom, a tablua of pink and princesses. Family photos filled the walls next to her bed. Rania and a friend in frilly dresses. Rania and her parents, their faces pressed against hers. Out in the hallway, the pictures continued. Rania baking cookies. Kamel and David leaning together for a couple selfie. The three of them enjoying ice cream on a sunny day. Round the corner and out into the living area. Body, bloody footprints stained the hardwood floor. The sleeping laptop in the kitchen slowly came back to life with the message on the screen. I have loved you all with all my heart. And in the office, a crimson flecked notebook bore a pair of handwritten instructions. Open the rise most recent version, said one. The other, submit to Allah now. David Crowley was the youngest son. I, I, I guess I, I kind of want to stop, but I kind of just want to keep reading the article. Um, <laughs> part of me wants to stop and address some of the things that were said here, but again, how many times can we keep going over these same things? Well, this article, just by core, it just makes me think, again, he's not really doing a lot of investigative research or anything, just kind of going through the motions maybe. And um, I believe uh, Mason Hendricks was a big part of this article here that we're actually reading. And maybe a couple other of the Gray State goons are probably part of that too. So now that the scene is set, right, they leave out a lot of different things, but that's to be expected in this case. Then uh, Corey's article kind of does some backtracking there. Does some backtracking. David Crowley was the youngest son of Dan and Kate Crowley. He remembered fondly a childhood spent scrapping with his older brother and playing neighborhood kickball with his younger sister, Allison. I enjoy being idolized by the little people of our neighborhood, David would later write. They'd even cheer when I came outside. He first dabbled in the movie making at Owatonna High School. David wrote and directed his first short film while still a teenager. After graduation, David left southern Minnesota to join the U.S. Army. As a soldier, he set foot in 13 countries, including combat deployments in Iraq and Kandahar, Afghanistan. David was, David was taciturn about his time in the service. He briefly mentioned how he saw ads, how he saw some of his friends get blown up by an IED in Afghanistan. Cousin Laura Meyer. Hokinson says, but that was it. It was obvious he didn't want to talk about the things he saw. Between tours, David spent his time at a base in Texas where he met Kamel Alon, a beautiful olive-skinned Saudi Arabian native. She had been raised Muslim in Pakistan and immigrated to the U.S. with her family in 2005. David fell fast. In the shadow of the massive Fort Hood military base, Kamel and David exchanged wedding vows before a justice of the peace in May 2008. So I do like the background stuff that we're getting here. 
um, as long as it's as it's accurate. Uh, very good background. I'll just see if I can maximize some of this a little bit more. But I, I like the background data that we're getting here. I think it's very good. They got married at Fort Hood. I didn't know that. Um, at the military base. Did not know that. I thought it was just like a, a city or, um, you know, like a local um, city hall or court. But this is saying it was at the military base they were actually married on. Did not know that. Pretty interesting for a couple reasons. That was in May of 2008. They dashed into parenthood with equal vigor. Their daughter, Rania, Rani, for short, was born August 2009. The same month Rania was born, then 24-year-old David retired from the military. The threesome headed north to the familiar geography of David's roots, landing first in Owatonna, Minnesota, before making their way to the Twin Cities. Kamel enrolled in grad school at the University of Minnesota, where she graduated in 2012 with a master's degree in public health nutrition. She started a career as a dietitian at the Park Nicolette Melrose Center. Coworkers noted how Kamel was almost always vibrant and smiling, walking the hallways effortlessly in sky-high heels. Meanwhile, David received his dormant interest in screenwriting, calling material from his stint as a soldier. He studied film while attending Minnesota School of Business. We watched Zero Dark Thirty together. He really wasn't a fan of it, says Sean Wright, who met David in 2010. He saw examples of how things weren't realistic, like a gun not being held properly or, or squads not in proper formation. It wasn't an exact style he was going after. It was more like what he was going after was every screen done perfectly. David began work on his own script in late 2010. Gray State was a fictional story of societal collapse pitting the, pitting the citizenry against a corrupt federal government hell-bent on destroying individual liberties. David hurled himself into its creation, laboring long hours to match the words on the pages with the scenes he had percolating in his mind. His home office was plastered with note cards, a web of plot points and character development connected by different colored strings. David would sequester himself for marathon writing sessions, emerging only when he was as Minnesota's, quote, only supplier of authentic military and police gear for film prop use, end quote. Head Hot, Hothead Productions would make music videos and films. Hothead Post with big plans. David and Howe collaborated with three others, including local actor Danny Mason, to bring David's screenplay to life. They made a Gray State trailer, raising more than $60,000 in production capital through crowdfunding. I thought it was $6,000. The 159-second official concept trailer premiered in July 2012. I thought it was August 2012. At least that's what the, the date of it is. Maybe it premiered before it was put up on YouTube. I thought it was August. It happened while we were sleeping, the trailer starts. Seconds later, the on-screen words appear. When society falls, those who panic die first. Libertarians, conspiracy theorists, and survivalists ate it up, believed by scenes of rioting and death squads. In a month, Gray State trailer had scored about 200,000 views. That number steadily began a march into the millions. Many had, a, many had a hand in making the trailer, but the franchise belonged to David, who is credited at the end as writer and director. David was writing the high of internet fandom less than a month after the trailer's release. He flew to Tampa to speak at the Ron Paul Festival. In a taped interview with Messengers for Liberty, a group formed to help inspire the message of liberty and restore America back to individual freedoms, the upstart filmmaker shines. More ads, more ads, lots of ads. But it's a free paper. Come on. What do you expect? How, they got to they gotta make some money too, right? You can't all have leggings. With confidence and vigor, 
The interview also gives a glimpse into its contradictions. David calls the trailer, quote, investor bait with infinite commercial viability for Hollywood backers. That's a little interesting. The interview also gives a glimpse into his contradictions. All right, let's see. David calls the trailer investor bait with infinite commercial viability for Hollywood backers. He says the work is part resume, part marketing tool, and part vision statement. Within minutes, he spins another narrative. Uh-oh. To turn the trailer into a feature movie, he explains, will require tens of millions of in capital. And he's of the belief that no Hollywood studio is going to back this film. Yet he seems convinced that the money was out there. Well, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't really see the contradiction there. It sounds like he's keeping all of his options open to what could happen here, to the possibilities. But this is Corey's article, and this is... Corey's opinions on it. The following month, he told a reporter for the Owatonna People's Press that the full-length action feature would, requ would require about $25 million. Really? The number didn't seem to phase him. If anything, he was exhilarated. So that's an interesting thing. So that would have been 2012. He's already talking about they would need $25 million for this project. That's pretty interesting. And I don't know about you. The first time I ever heard of the $25 million was from a guy named Jordan Page, who David Crowley did several music videos for. Um, Jordan Page and David Crowley were obviously friends and had worked together. And that's where I first heard about the quote unquote $25 million budget, not $25 million in David's pocket. That was never the case, but it was always 25 minutes. This is pretty early on. I did not know the Owatonna People's Press. He told the he told a report a reporter for the Owatonna People's Press that the full length feature would require about 25 million. Very interesting. All right, so now we're getting into a gray state. Interesting title for this section of Corey's article just happens to be the title of Eric Nelson's film. Ooh, <laughs> here we go. As of 2013 holiday season, as the 2013 holiday season began, the Crowleys were settling into their new home, a Rambler on Ramsdale Drive in Apple Valley. Kamel had quit her job as a staff dietitian and was now six months into running her own home-based small business, a holistic counseling and nutrition service. So she's running her own business out of the home. David's future seemed brighter than ever. Riding the movie trailer's momentum, he plunged into rewriting the feature script as well as embarking on a side project. The Rise would be the sister documentary to the fictional work, full of interviews with like-minded Americans who feared for their country's future. David kept his growing fan base informed with regular social media posts. After two years of trying to extract the Gray State story, I think I may have finally done it, he wrote in early 2014. The story has completely changed, is working beautifully, and the new outline was completed in only the last three days. With this new story, it will not be hard to attract funding. So again, I don't know about the contradictions that Zorowski is talking about. Uh, to me, it just sounds like Eric, or it sounds like David is just keeping all of his options open, and he says no Hollywood pro producer, no Hollywood company. I it sounds like he's talking about the big companies, right? And we know that there were a few people that did bite towards it. At least one, Michael Entertainment Group, kind of a startup uh, pr production group. Now, both Michael O'Donnell and Michael Bozio had been doing things; they had worked in the business, but this could have been their you know, not only would David Crowley could have used Gray State to get his foot into the door to make other movies, to be part of other Hollywood projects, um, this would have been great for the Michael Entertainment Group. And I think after this happened, you know, we didn't we don't really hear that much about the Michael Entertainment Group. I don't even know if they're still in existence. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I tried to look up their website and try to look up the Facebook page, everything was gone. So what happened to MEG? What happened to the Michael Inter Entertainment Group? It's something that I forgot to kind of touch on um, in our last podcast that we just did, most recent podcast that uh, will come out August 1st.
He also wasn't shy about playing the role of tortured artist. Wow, a tortured artist. <laughs> it's a strange experience finally feeling gen genuine love for characters I've created. The most painful part of writing the conflict for these people who are precious to me is that I must now torture them, punish them, and drag them through the dirt to reveal their essence of form. It sounds like he's talking about torturing the uh, uh, the characters. I don't know how this makes him, how he's playing the role of a tortured artist. So Corey Jorowski takes a lot of liberties in this uh, article here. And so far, I'm not not going to call it a hit piece so far here, but it's borderline. It's borderlining it. What are you going to give us, Corey? Let's see what else you got. In the first six months of 2014, David began traveling to Hollywood, eager to ink a movie deal. Producers perceived him as somewhat enigmatic, genuine and intense, affable yet guarded. Big words. Oof. Big words for me. He negotiated with direct eye contact and said hello and bid goodbye with handshakes a bit to turn. What? With handshakes a bit to to turn his three minutes of film into a motion picture or Netflix series would require collaboration. So I need to read that again just because uh, I'm reading from part from the bottom of one. He negotiated with direct eye contact and said hello and bid goodbye with handshakes a bit too to turn his three minutes of film into a motion picture or Netflix series would require collaboration. There must be am I missing something here. Ah, ah, there it is. Sorry, guys. No, sorry, I'm gonna read that again. He negotiated with direct eye contact and said hello and bid goodbye with handshakes a bit too firm. A bit too firm with his handshakes. How would Corey Zorowski know that that <laughs> David's handshakes were a bit too firm? He confided in at least one new Hollywood contact that he harbored a wholesome distrust of the very industry he was courting. I wonder who that Hollywood contact is. Must have been somebody Corey Zorowski spoke with, right? How many people did Corey Zorowski speak to for this article here? And there are a lot of ads on here. Um, some several columns, double columns, triple columns. Started on page nine. You can see we're all the way down to page 13 here. And I don't know. I mean, what do you guys think? To me, it's just something very off about this article. Something very unorganic. But I like that sentence. He confided in at least one new Hollywood contact that he harbored a wholesome distrust for the very industry he was courting. David, and what? how many people in Hollywood probably feel the same way? and still make movies and still make films in Hollywood. David had a wary understanding that to turn his three minutes of film into a motion picture or Netflix series would require collaboration. It's interesting that the Netflix is already being discussed here. But again, this is somebody feeding Corey Zorowski all of this data. Corey Zorowski is not going out there uh, doing a lot of, of research and doing a lot of his own investigations. He's talking with people and getting their thoughts, getting their views, and then forming some of these things here. I just happen to be one of those people that he was talking to that uh, he really, you know, didn't. It's, I don't, I don't want to get too much into my conversation with him yet. I want to save that. I want to save that for a little bit later. All right, let's continue on here. But he wasn't hip to that. What do you mean? He believed Hollywood was full of flakes and thieves who, if he wasn't careful, would steal what was his. Uh, yeah, I think we all know that. Giving up the project's reins raised possibilities that the message awakening Americans to their threatened liberty could be mixed if the new handlers thought it commercially unviable. That's the whole basis of the of the film, of the trailer. And of course, if it's if any final project doesn't match that, it's not gonna work out. It's not, it's it's gonna be a failure. So let's read on. For David, it was never about being famous or not being famous. He was very humble 
The end game or the end goal wasn't a movie, miniseries, whatever, says Wright. Crowley's friend. <laughs> Crowley's friend. Okay. It was more about Gray State, the movement, really. It was about a movement. I don't see anything where David is talking about a movement. Maybe for Sean Wright, it was supposed to be about some type of a movement. Because this guy loves to get involved in movements. Not create a movement, but leech off of movements. That's his MO. At the start of 2014, yeah, that's when we really thought it was going to be a reality. We thought it was going to be a reality. He thought, Sean Wright thought he was going to be part of this reality. When David's day one journal shows David is, is trying to get Sean Wright out of his life, pretty much. I mean, he, when David talks about people leeching off of him and people asking him for favors and wanting to be hired and you can hire me for $50,000. He's talking about guys like Sean Wright. And, of course, Corey Zorowski doesn't know any, any of this stuff. He's just interviewing the people that are very vocal about David's death and that David Crowley is a killer. And these are supposed to be David's friends. Keep that in mind. These are supposed to be David's friends who accuse David Crowley of these baseless accusations and show what disgusting human beings they are. Camilla accompanying him to Los Angeles in late May, him being David Crowley. Their sixth anniversary was celebrated together with the news of a lifetime. It just happened, he posted days later on Facebook, he being David Crowley. Gray State will be auctioned in the next two weeks at a major budget and connected with A-list talent. We are connected with a producer who, above all else, wants to preserve the film's pro-liberty ideals. This is all we could have hoped for and more. He spoke too soon, writes Corey Zorowski. There was no close. No close. <laughs> he was very close. Very close. He returned to the West Coast the following month, bucking again to ink a deal. I, what is, I don't know why Corey Zorowski would say that David Crowley spoke too soon. There was no close. No close. I don't know. It's just, man, you know. I, I, when I spoke with Corey Zorowski, I didn't get the, didn't really get the feeling that he really knew that much about this case. Um, but Man, it's just like, dude, like, what are you writing here? What type of a hit piece are you trying to create here and why? Who hurt you, Corey? Late June produced another premature announcement. Everything is premature. Everything is, see, it's the, the, it's the narrative. He's just going along with the narrative because he, he believes where this concludes, like many people who do. You know, they believe David Crowley did this. They believe it all ends with David Crowley doing this. So they take liberties to kind of throw in those little hints there that could also be taken in a different way. And it's it's something every writer can do. Every quote unquote citizen journalist could do, I guess, if, if they wanted to, if they wanted to back the whole narrative, you could throw in some of those little jabs here. There's been a lot of jabs here thrown. Wait for the right hook. Reading on. Late June produced another premature announcement. My attorney and I are reviewing the option contract this week. This is in June of 2014. And once that sucker is signed, this whole gray state thing is going to finally, irretrievably, and monstrously take off for the stratosphere. And in such a way that the message will be preserved and perhaps even continue in sequels, TV series, and video games. This is all planning for the for the future. We're talking about June of 2020, June of 2014. All planning for the future, but they have to spin this a little bit, throw in those little jabs. It's a premature announcement. It's not a premature announcement. It's transparency. David is letting people know, including the haters, including people that he's already cut out that he wants to cut out of this project including the leeches who are trying to leech on to David Crowley because they don't have a creative bone in their body. So they can only leech off of David's create creativity and other people's creativity, not just David. 
but they do this to a lot of people. And here David is in at Universal Studios. This is uh, from 24, May of 2014 when he was there. And uh, yeah, <laughs> they're going to say a few months later, this guy's going to brutally, brutally kill his family and himself with a deal in the works, with a Hollywood deal in the works. You buying that? All right, this we're still on page 14. I'm just going to minimize this to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, page 14. I'm going to look at the column number two. Now, the grandiose proclamations. Grandiose proclamations. I mean, man, this guy is just really... You would almost think he's got some type of hatred or something towards David, but I think he's just he just doesn't have a clue. Right? You know, the more I read this, I think Corey Zorowski really doesn't have a clue. I could see why the city page is shut down. I don't know what he's doing now. If Corey Zorowski is open to changing his mind or to looking at some more evidence that maybe maybe he didn't have back then, or we didn't have back then. But it seems like we kept a more open mind than this guy did. We'll see. The grandiose proclamations shriveled again as the option contract faded from David's social media updates. It did not fade. The proclamation and all this stuff, I mean, as, as late as se September, David was writing about it. Even as late as December, David was writing about the rise, planning for the, for the future. It's all there. It's all in his social media stuff. The stuff that we were able to, to get um, before people tried to, tried to delete David's Facebook posts, Facebook comments, things like that. Thankfully, the police were able to grab some of the more relevant ones. It just happened to be related to Sean Wright and his tax stuff. But here, Corey is saying that the grandiose proclamation shriveled again as that option contract faded from David's social media updates. Yet David and Kamel were dodgily optimistic for months to come, of course, because they were still working with the mics. According to police records, Kamel, according, no, according to what the police wrote in their PDF, is probably more accurate. Kamel told a friend in the fall that David, quote, got a multi-million dollar movie deal. Her husband in late September boasted to brother Dan about he'd soon be flying to L.A. for final negotiations with producers. And he was going to be a millionaire by the end of the year. David's cousin, Laura Meyer Hopinson, attended Ronnie's fifth birthday party in August 2014. It was held in the family's backyard on Ramsdale Drive. The princess-themed celebration brought together grandparents. And we'll go to the next column. Ron Ronnie's aunt, there's a typo. Hey, we all do typos. Ronnie's aunt and uncle, Ronnie's aunt and uncle, and other relatives. Ronnie's aunt and uncle. <laughs> Hokinson remembers Camille's alabaster smile, Ronya's pink frosted cake, and David's, and David, the lovely dovey, the lovey dovey family man. <laughs> it's a mouthful, sorry. Alabaster. Never heard that word before. I may have to look that one up. They looked like a couple very much in love, Hokinson says. They were all about family, and he seemed like a person who professionally was about to enter into a time when his life's dreams were about to come true. But, of course, here we go. Here's the but. Behind the facade of backyard festivities, however, anxiety festered. Here we go. More of the speculation. More of the speculation uh, that Corey Zorowski just loves to throw in there. <laughs> According to statements later given by her younger sister, Sidra, to investigators, Kamel had called their family in Texas a few months prior. Financial stress was mounting, Kamel reported. She remained the family's only financial provider, while David showed no inclination to bring in another paycheck. Wow. She wondered aloud if she should stay in the marriage after a, pe after a pep talk from dad. Kamel hung up, 
pledging to fight for the relationship. David also stressed about money. He sent three direct messages to Oregon-based film pro, film pro David Kirk West in June. Now, David Kirk West is another interesting one that will, will be brought up in the future podcast episodes because, um, uh, well, because of some of this same stuff. Around the same time, he'd been publicly declaring a done movie deal. So David is declaring done movie deal. And what happens? Here's what David asks David Kirk West, Oregon-based film pro David Kirk West. How do you live with filmmaking as your profession? David asks. Don't you stress and worry? I can't get away from evil thoughts some days. All of this taken out of context. These guys like David Kirk West and uh, Corey Zorowski, Sean Wright, Mason Hendricks, Danny August Mason, all these guys have no, no issue, no shame in just kind of taking some of these things David said and twisting them. Twisting them. Why? For what purpose? For what purpose here? David Kirk West was another guy so quickly came out to say David Crowley was guilty and everybody just needs to accept it way before they had any information. I mean, this would have been as early as, you know, um, February, March of 20, 2015, maybe even earlier. I think a lot of people were being prompted to come out and say David Crowley is, is guilty. Everybody needs to just back off and just let the police do their work, et cetera, et cetera. And we did. But we kept on and kept on and were able to pretty much show why David Crowley is not guilty. Where did these guys go? These guys left. They left their friend in the dirt. They didn't wait. They didn't wait for all of the facts, for the evidence, for the DNA results, for the autopsies. They didn't wait for any of that to come out before they accused David Crowley. They began with the accusations that David Crowley was guilty and never, ever tried to backtrack on it. Pretty sad. Continuing on, fade to black. David, and let me talk, let's talk about fade to black because when David died, the gray state goons probably getting so much flack on their pages, they had to fade to black. Remember when they said they were gonna, they were gonna go dark and they were gonna just uh, stop talking about it basically. going to it. Oops, where'd I go? There it is. David handled the growing unease the same way he went after creating movies. He attacked it. In September, David and partner Mitch Heil agreed to sever all business ties. Crowley got rid of the leftover movie props in a garage sale. Two days before October, he told followers on Facebook he alone was piloting Gray State from here on out. And that he was excited at the prospect of rebuilding a new trustworthy team. More planning for the future. Two days before October of 2014. More planning for the future. Hmm. The new month kicked off with an email to Danny Mason's lawyer insisting the actor sign away any rights he might have to the franchise. As Crowley cut ties with associates, the couple pulled away from family and friends. Both got new cell numbers without telling David's sister and mother. Kamel's mother had been diagnosed with cancer over the summer. Kamel disapproved of the family's choice to use chemotherapy. Fighting cancer by pumping one's body into toxic medicine ran counter to Kamel's beliefs about health and wellness. Stop contacting my wife. We want nothing to do with you. David barked at Kamel's father over the phone on October 12th. They'd ex explicitly said not to put Kamel's mother on chemo. 
you refuse to follow now suffer the consequences. Again, a lot of things that can all be taken out of context, especially if you want to make sure people do that, take it out of context. If you want to make sure people have the accurate facts and information, you should include a lot of that stuff. Maybe Corey didn't have that at this time, but what did he have? And what counter was there here? Where's the counter? Well, let's look at this. Jordan Page, who identified himself as a longtime friend who had deployed with David. What? He didn't deploy with David. <laughs> Jordan Page, who identified himself as a longtime friend who had deployed with David. I don't believe <laughs> it's, it's more inaccurate stuff. On Facebook, he declared on Facebook, the film was about to start production with a $30 million budget from a major Hollywood studio. The theory spread from there, self-sewing across YouTube comment sections and conspiracy websites. Dan Hinnon is an accountant from Chaska by day, an amateur investigator by night. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's uh, Bruce Wayne in the day, a Batman at night. Love it. He estimates he's invested no less than 200 hours researching the Crowley deaths. He's on assignment to ask questions. He's on assignment to ask questions that were ignored by police. Who, who's put him on this assignment? I don't know. It's just some of the way Corey Zorowski phrases this stuff is pretty laughable and not very accurate. And a lot of it to me just seems like just propaganda pure propaganda here, trying to just twist everything and to just back up the narrative that David Crowley did this. He's crazy. He's guilty. The deal was dead. He wasn't making money. His wife was making all the money. She was going to leave him, and he had to kill everybody. That's what I would read. If I was reading this, had no idea. If I didn't do my own research, if I was a lazy bum and just read this article, that's what I would think. Here's what Dan Hannon says. There was a rush to judgment within 48 hours of the crime that shows this wasn't vigorously pursued by police. I agree, Hinnon says. My thing is, none of us are professional investigators, yet this thing is sitting in plain sight to see. It doesn't take much education to put two and two together and realize things don't add up. Foremost, David lacked motive, Hinnon argues. Some of his estranged Gray State collaborators had $30 million good reasons. $30 million good reasons. David was getting looked at as the next big up-and-coming director, but he turned down a $30 million offer because he would have to give up creative control, says Hinnon. Here you have other members of the project's creative team who'd invested all this time and money that weren't going to get a payoff. I think you have to follow the money. Independent researcher Tom Lapp followed Gray State closely since its start in 2012. When news broke of the tragedy, it didn't sit right with him. This is interesting because we don't hear too much from, from Tom Lapp, from Thomas Lapp. For people that don't know, uh, let's go back to the Facebook. You have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. The Facebook group that Dan Hinnon started called Justice for David Crowley and Family. On the same day, Thomas Lapp, Tom Lapp, started uh, a Facebook page page called uh, David Crowley or Justice for David Crowley of Gray State. They started these on the same day, did not know each other. Eventually, Thomas Lapp would kind of disappear. I don't know what happened to him, but Dan Hinn would then take over that page. So here's what Thomas Lapp says. One of the few um, comments that I've been able to find, I found a few, but um, this is one of the very few that you'll probably find after David's death regarding Thomas Lapp. David was doing well, Thomas Lapp said. He was excited to release the documentary. There was some kind of movie deal in the works, says Lapp, founder of the Justice for David Crowley and Grace of Gray State Facebook page. Can't even get that right. Ah, Corey can't even get some of those things right. That's okay. Basically, it was his whole dream to be a movie maker, and it was about to come true. It didn't add up. Why would somebody in that position just kill their family and themselves? Excellent question. Great question right there. What would be David's motive there? But that's why they had to put everything else first. They had to show David didn't have a deal. The deal was dead, didn't have money, 
arguments with, with his wife, wasn't giving his phone number to his family. They, they're psychologically trying to mind F us, trying to get us to psychologically to uh, subconsciously, sorry, subconsciously put all of these twisted um, uh, assumptions in our mind. So when it gets down to it and we say, wait a minute, that's it. That's all you guys have that proves David guilty. You don't have anything here. They go back to the people who are um, very susceptible and people who are not very uh, bright will probably just buy into this based on their preconceived notions about David, about his work, or about some of the other things here, or maybe just about the people that are looking into it. You never know. What about this citizen journalist guy? <laughs> but I believe Thomas Lapp, that's a great, that's a great question right there. Um, some good quotes from Dan Hinnon and from Thomas Lapp in this article here. Now, here's a citizen journalist, Greg Fernandez Jr. He points to various peculiarities. Definitive fingerprints couldn't be ascertained on the handgun. It doesn't make sense that David was right-handed, yet the weapon was found on his left, to the left of him. Investigators never fully vetted why the rear patio was ajar. There's a lot more. I don't know if he... Uh, covers um, the other, I mean, the main thing is the bullets, right? The, the bullet, the two bullets that they missed. And I think it wasn't that big, that big of a deal to uh, Corey Zorowski that those bullets were missed. <laughs> I don't know why. It should be two of the most important things of this case here. The patio door makes people like Fernandez and Hannon wonder if the family was murdered by someone they knew. That's not, it doesn't make me wonder if they were murdered by um, someone they knew. It just makes me wonder why police would focus on there being no struggle, no signs of a struggle when you are forced entry, when you don't need a struggle or forced entry with the rear slider open. So again, twisting, a lot of twisting here um, that we see happen a lot with a lot of different people who write articles all based on uh, thinking that David Crowley is is guilty. Look at the way that they write articles, and then you know compare that to what you see in a book by a citizen uh, journalist, Greg Fernandez. What else do we have here? Uh, we've been led to believe their dog was alone in the house for three weeks, Hennon says. The house had two bathrooms. Even if one or both the toilet lids were open, allowing the dog to drink water, there's no way Paleo could have survived that long without someone or persons being there to get him water. This point has never been addressed by law enforcement. That's true. They've never been addressed. I mean, really, there's three bathrooms, but the dog did have access to two of the of the uh, toilets um, of of the three. But yeah, never never addressed. The, the investigators, you know, when we asked about the um, water source, it was the toilets and it was the bodies, the blood. Leo is a blood drinker, apparently, to these guys. David's cousin, Laura Meyer Hokinson. I just need to go back up to the next page. So Laura Meyer Hokinson's doubts are more personal because this is David's cousin. Intuition tells her the deaths had to do with the dynamics of making the movie. She declined to elaborate. I know David... I know David wanted for his movie to get out there, and he wanted to make it big, she says. He really wanted people to see what he had to tell, and he wanted his family healthy and happy. No matter what police say, I can never see him being capable of this. So we've always, I mean, this is a, a cousin, and we know that there are other people. She's not the only one. There are other family members who also believe like this, that no matter what, I can never see him being capable of this. You don't hear a lot from them. They don't want you to hear a lot from them. The propagandists 
the goons, the trolls, they want you to think that all of the family believe David did this, and that is simply not true. And here you have it. One of the few times, one of the only times you're going to hear something like this. And it goes, I'm sure it goes a lot deeper. Some of you may have contact with some of these family members that feel the same way that Laura does. And here you have the definitive, the definitive proof that not all family members believe David did this. That's huge. According to her, family members don't spend much time looking for answers because it's like a trapping wind. Everyone in my family believes suicide is wrong, she says. Him doing that, it's not in his personality at all. That's it. She nails it right there. The disbelievers who prefer to be called conspiracy realists. Really? I don't prefer to be called any of the disbelievers. Ugh. Here we go. You know, Corey just had to go there. He had to get into all that. <laughs> conspiracy re remain dedicated to their tasks. It's a simple task. Either David is guilty because there's evidence. If there's no evidence to show David is guilty, why are you acting like there is? And that's where Corey's article should have concluded. A lot of these articles written, they should have all concluded that, you know what? There really is nothing to prove David Crowley guilty. Think whatever you want. Believe whatever you want. But they didn't do that. They failed. They failed their audiences. They failed the people that trusted them to make, a, to make the right decision to do good, basic reporting. Simple reporting. They failed. I cover conspiracies that are real, Hannon says. Our group doesn't focus on conspiracy theories, just facts, because we don't want to get looped in with these conspiracy theory crowds, these people off the deep end, which they are, they are out there. We still don't know if David was responsible. That's what Dan Hannon says. What offends me is professional investigators aren't asking the questions some people won't like. That's why we're doing it. We're the ones presenting the facts. We're not these nut jobs out there with tin foil caps. Perfectly stated. Perfectly stated. All right, let's talk about the build up here. Oh, we're getting into James Gummer. Oh, great. Don't have much more time here, so this is perfect. Let's get right into Mr. Gummer here. It's always a good one. Uh, oh, that's as far as it goes. Okay, Apple Valley Police De Detective Sergeant James Gummer. Wishes his department had a better explanation than a man succumbing to the dark side. <laughs> yeah, we all do. And if you don't, why would you just say that? How are you going to prove that a man succumbed to the dark side? No, it should be we have David's gun. We have, you know, the evidence that David shot somebody. We have something. But you, all you have is that a man succumbed to the dark side? We're not talking about Jedi's. And Sith here. This isn't a Star Wars movie. This is real life. You don't succumb to the dark side. This isn't a George Lucas film here. <laughs> That's pretty. I mean, to believe David Crowley did it, you have to believe every all of this is fiction. It's all fiction writing. Unlike what you get from us. Me. This is uh, what Gummert says. Me, like everybody else on this case who's a parent, we wanted to find out what happened for the five-year-old to get some peace, some answers, and to try to make sense of a horrible tragedy, says Gummert. If there was something else we could have explored, trust me, we would have. Yeah, there's many things that you could have explored and should have explored and should still be exploring. And my God, why aren't you? Why aren't you? You can't say, you know, you're doing this for the family and if there was something else we could have done. If there is, then at least admit you guys cannot prove David Crowley guilty. Why is that so difficult? What would be the big problem with that? Hmm? You'd have to admit that you were wrong. You'd have to admit that there is nothing to prove David guilty. And where would that lead you? That means you'd have to actually get off your ass and do your job. Okay, that means you have to continue to do your job. You're going to continue to do your job. 
because David is not guilty. And something else happened here. Or you need to continue looking for the evidence of his guilt. How long has it been and you still can't come up with it? So you just stop looking and just say, David, turn to the dark side. Join the Emperor Palpatine. And he's now a Sith. A uh, dead Sith, right? It's all crazy. Then Dorowski just writes it like, ah, it's not good. Then Gummert just says it like, ah. And yet we're the ones. We're, we're the bad guys. Because we, we want to know what really happened in this case. We're the bad guys. That's all it is. While unanswered questions will remain, every unearthed fact from investigation pointed to David, according to Gummer. And that's the thing. What are these facts? And they've never been able to provide these facts. They just say, oh, there are facts that point to David. There's no facts that point to David. Absolutely none. What facts point to David? That's why they never give them to you. Here's what he says. Here's what Gummer says. In life, more often than, see, it's not even about David now. It's just in, in life. More often than not, very general. It's the subsequent little events over time that add up. What happened that day was a buildup over time. That is exactly what the article just did. That's what Eric Nelson's film tries to, to do. That's what the People article did. All of these hit pieces, Alec Wilkinson, they all just try to give these. This is all they can do. This give you little subsequent little events over time and hope that you will buy into it. Those aren't facts. Those aren't facts that prove David did any of these killings. One could argue those are probably facts that prove the opposite. And we can go back and forth on that. But don't call them unearthed facts. Don't call them facts that say there are facts that point to David doing this, and then you can't give us those facts because you know what? You don't have them because they do not exist. That's the real key here. Any facts of David's guilt do not exist. This is why you get comments like this from Gummert and from other people in life, <laughs> in life, more often than not. Based on what? Based on what? No, that's, that's, no, there's no facts there. It's a subsequent little event over time that add up. No facts there either. What happened that day was a buildup over time. No facts there either. What you should be able to do, if there are facts, and there will be facts that would show David Crowley killed his family and killed himself. You don't have those facts. You don't have any facts that show David is guilty, period. Investigators surmise personal issues and financial troubles conflicted with David's narcissism and entitlement. See, here we go again. More speculation, more slandering of David Crowley, getting right to the matter of it. Because at this point, people who read this article are expecting some facts. They're really expecting to see something. And they get to the end of the article, and it's like, that's it? That's all you have? Like you have nothing here. You have nothing here that shows David Crowley did this. Why are you writing this article? You know, what, this article is just like many other articles. And like these in investigators, just like many of these investigators, just like they just, <laughs> we don't have anything else. We, we're just going to, you know, they surmise personal issues. What personal issues? Financial troubles. What financial troubles? It's a $14,000 check on the doorstep. If that's financial troubles, man, then I got a lot more financial troubles than David will ever have. <laughs> it's craziness. And they conflicted with his narcissism and entitlement. The narcissism and entitlement, especially the narcissism thing, thing seems to come from uh, Mason, Mason Hendricks and Sean Wright, who were probably both narcissists themselves. Um, Mason Hendricks told me that he is, but he says David was was worse. David's more of a narcissist than he is, <laughs> which is interesting. It's ironic for a narcissist to say that, I guess, or maybe strange. But and the the entitlement. So again, we're, he's using a Corey is using a lot of very strange things to slander David Crowley here in this article. Very interesting. Um, I don't remember the police ever using narcissism or entitlement. So, um, 
But what we do know is that the police, in their in their documents, they said that there were no financial issues. There's no financial motive. So for Corey Zorowski to say that the investigators surmise personal issues and financial troubles, if they're trying to really say that the, this is what this is what contributed to David's death and everything. But in their own documents, the police make it very clear that the financial troubles, personal issues, there was no motive or not a motive for David to have done any of these things that he's being accused of. That's important. That's important. Kamel, police believe, played along because she bowed to David's untold emotional and psychological manipulation. So again, Kamel, they're saying police are trying to say that David was an, an abuser and the pack theory, but we talked with the police. There is no pack theory. So where is Corey Zorowski getting this information from? It has to come from Gummer. Um, she played along? Played along with what? What would Kamel be playing along with? She's playing along with David killing their five-year-old child, shooting her twice in the head, and then David killing himself. Why would she play along with that? Emo untold emotion. If it's untold, then how do you know that there is emotional or psychological m manipulation? It's very, very odd stuff here. These guys are reaching for the sky. They are throwing everything they can against the wall and seeing what sticks. And I'll tell you, none of it is sticking. And it will never stick. That's why they fail. That's why City Pages is gone. That's why you don't want to hear from Corey. That's why Gummer doesn't want to talk about it. That's why these guys don't want to talk about it. Because they know better. They hope it goes away and it's not going to. Sorry. The book is out there. Videos are out there. Podcasts is out there. Catherine's information is out there. It's way too much data. It's never going away. The best thing for them to do is to get off their ass and solve this case. Find out what really happened. You have to. That's your job. That's what you get paid for. If you can't do it, then you shouldn't be on the force. Article also says darkness squeezed tighter as the weather got colder. Right. Darkness squeezed tighter as the weather got colder. That's, not, that's pure fiction writing right there. That's something you would hear in a fiction novel. Um, Corey Zorowski is practicing some of his fiction writing here. That's cool. And Corey, man, if you ever want to, you know, get back back in touch, if you ever want to do something real, uh, you know where you know where to contact me. Contact me, thegraceage at gmail.com. Not hard to find. Um, and man, let's let's talk about this. Let's talk about this article. What did you get right? What did you get wrong? What do you feel bad about now? Do you need more information? Do you need the real data? Have you looked at the real data here? Because if you're going to take the responsibility to write an article like this, you have to be able to um, accept the fact that you're wrong about this article, that this article is garbage. And hey, why don't you write a real article? If you need all of the documents, the real documents, they're all there. You can get them all, and uh, you can clearly see that there's nothing to prove David Crowley guilty. That's how this article should have ended, I, I believe. Delusions of movie-making grandeur couldn't peacefully coexist with life's hardships. I mean, this whole – this is just – what are you writing here? Man? This whole paragraph right here is just complete fiction, speculation. Conspiracy. You know the definition of a conspiracy? And then compare it to what these quote-unquote investigators have created here. Aligned with the gray state goons. Aligned with other weirdos. That is a conspiracy. To try to convince you that David Crowley is guilty when he's not. Kamel's body would be flown to Texas and buried. David was cremated. His family would not disclose the location of his remains. Ronnie was also cremated. Half of her remains were buried with her mother. Half are interred with David. So half of Kamel, half of Ronya went to, um, from what he's saying, half of Ronya went to um, Texas to be buried with the mom, and then half went to David. We know that that is not true. We talked with um, Kamel's friend, 
I was in Texas and they did not receive any of the remains of Rania at the, at the time of this writing. It wasn't until 2018, 2019 maybe. So where is Corey getting this false information? False information, Corey. You should really think about that. And maybe next time, do a little more research. And maybe it's time to admit that you wrote a hit piece on David Crowley. A shameful hit piece. Be sorry for that. And that will shut this one down. Until next time, my friends, thank you all for joining me. God bless you all.